Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa sayyidullah 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 Good evening everyone uh, and welcome to uh, this webinar which we hope will uh, provide uh, the knowledge and information needed to uh, help everyone out there interested in uh, e-learning and the integration of technology uh, have uh, a more um, uh, 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 or a bigger view of how to utilize the technologies out there to improve learning and performance. Uh, before I introduce our guest, uh, I would like to start and lay uh, a foundation to our uh, discussions today uh, by reminding everyone of the uh, uh, AACT or the Association for Education, Communication and Technology definition of educational technology. Education technology is the study of ethical, uh, ethic, is the study and ethical practice of facilitating learning and improving performance by creating, using, managing appropriate technological processes and resources. And this is associated with different pedagogical and pedagogical uh, uh, practices that would uh, emphasize or get us to this point of where learning happens using technology. Also, there is there is a, a quote uh, by uh, George Kors who says that technology will not replace great teachers, uh, but technology in the hands of great teachers can be transformational. Uh, it all, he also added that technology is not just a tool; it can give learners a voice they may not have had before, and that is so true. Uh, one of the biggest benefits that uh, any a uh, person who have used technology in education uh, would say that the students now can learn on their own pace. The students can go up and down and review and see and double check. There are so many things. But today or tonight, we're gonna talk about e-learning starting from the beginning and where we're going in the future. And to do this, uh, our esteemed guest, uh, Professor Ray Schroeder, who is a professor emeritus and Assistant Vice Chancellor of Online Learning at the University of Illinois, Springfield. He is also the Senior Fellow at the University Professional and Continuing Education Association. Ray has taught for the past half century. He has dedicated the last 23 years to online learning. The author of many publications in the field, Ray creates a number of distance education reading lists through social media. So uh, welcome, Professor Ray. Uh, I won't take much of your time. Uh, we just need to inform our part, uh, the attendees. They can ask all their questions through the QA. So, and we'll answer them uh, uh, as as we get them. And uh, by the end of of the uh, of the professor's presentation, and then we'll go through the Q and A. So please welcome again, and the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Fahad. It's, it's just, uh, I am honored greatly to be able to speak to this vast audience um, of uh, faculty, students, instructional technologists, trainers. It's a, a great opportunity. And I hope that I'll be able to share some new things with you that may be useful to you uh, as you move forward. Of course, we are in what a challenging time. Um, you know, the time of this little tiny COVID virus that is uh, uh, creating such havoc around the world. <clears throat> and so e-learning has really become uh, the primary delivery mechanism for education from primary, elementary, secondary, higher education um, around the world. And so it, it's more important than ever that we look at uh, where e-learning is and where it has come, come from. Well, first, before I really begin, uh, a bit of an introduction. Um, <clears throat> the presentation format I use is one that is PowerPointless. Uh, with an emphasis on pointless. Um, you know, I think that PowerPoints um, have less value because they're two-dimensional and because they uh, uh, 
are not easily updated or easily shared. So as I teach and as I work with our learners, we, I, I tend to use websites and Google provides this opportunity. So I encourage you all to uh, copy and paste or, or hand copy this URL because the intent is this is something that you may use uh, in the future. And we're not going to be able to get all the way through all the details at this site. So it is, as you see here, um, and simply if you can copy that, I think you'll find it a useful meta site, a useful reference for the future. And as you're doing that, by way of a brief synopsis, uh, in order to understand where we are today and to look into the future of e-learning, we have to look briefly at the past and understand that context. Um, certainly way back in 1924, uh, there was distance learning and it was done via letters sent from student to the faculty member. But in the 1960s came the development of the Plato computer system, <clears throat> which at that point was not on the internet because it predated the internet as we know it. Um, and it was really computer terminals linked through mainframe computers, one big mainframe on each continent. And these, uh, these terminals would send uh, their transmissions to the mainframe and then it would be redistributed. Well, um, so that's really kind of the foundation. I'll get to a little more of that in a moment. Um, in the United States in 2005, there was a massive hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, that closed 22 universities along the Gulf of Mexico. And that for our country was a seminal moment in developing online and expanding online in time of emergency, such as we see with the current virus. Currently, millions, literally millions of classes around the world are now online or preparing to go online. And this for many is uh, many students and faculty is their first exposure to online learning. Well, it, it, you know, it was by immersion, you know, people were dumped into this with uh, a week or two's notice. So um, it has both positive and negative benefits. Those, the, the rapid deployment has not given us time to fully develop those courses. And again, we'll talk about that, but we'll also talk about the long-term impact, which is exposing the world to e-learning. In the future, e-learning will become even more learner-centered and much smarter through artificial intelligence and toward the end of this decade, quantum computing. And it will be a remarkable change. It will be far different than we have now or many of us have imagined. So let's, the, the quick look at the past, um, that Plato system in 1960, um, low those many uh, 60 years ago, had what they called personal notes which were in fact email. They had something called term talk, which was texting. talk matic which was group chat and notes files. I know this, I, I worked on the system and uh, had uh, my first publication was with the University of Hawaii Manoa. And so uh, two universities separated by, I don't know, six, 7,000 miles. Uh, where the two classes met together via computer. And that was way back in the 70s. So Plato created the beginning, but then came the internet. And as we all know, we're connected worldwide. Um, it began uh, <clears throat> really on a, a, a project for uh, the Department of Defense, but expanded worldwide ultimately. And there was, uh, I will claim for the University of Illinois, a fellow named Mark Andreessen. He was a student 
who did not finish his degree. I've got to say that. He didn't finish his degree, but he was a student in computer science and he worked part-time at the, our campus, just 90 miles from where I am now. And he developed something called Mosaic and later released it um, commercially as Netscape. And that was the beginning of the World Wide Web and the internet that most of us know. Well, shortly after that came learning management systems. And this is just a look at the rise and fall of various kinds of learning management systems. WebCT, Blackboard, Moodle, Brightspace, Canvas, Sakai, many systems are out there. And right now, our e-learning is LMS, Learning Management System centric. It really centers on uh, using a learning management system. And that creates the framework for the delivery of our classes with discussion boards and opportunity, a grade book and opportunities for the faculty member to uh, engage students and the like. And the three leading ones today are these three. The future of the LMS is significant. It's going to change. It is changing even now. And the biggest change I think for us to recognize is that it is going to be, and we are becoming more learner centered. Number of reasons for that. One has to do with MOOCs, M-O-O-C-S. You've heard of, of uh, Coursera or uh, some of the other MOOC providers. Um, now students have alternatives. They don't have to come uh, take classes online or face-to-face -face at your university or mine. Uh, they can take these classes, these uh, very massive online classes. And so those MOOCs have worked toward centering on the learner and being responsive to the learner. And that's something that we all have to recognize. In order to facilitate the best learning, we need to uh, focus on the learner and not the professor. I'll give you a brief example. Back, gosh, you know, earlier, far earlier in my teaching career, maybe 30 years ago, we used to schedule our classes where the full professors got to choose when they taught their classes. Well, I had a bowling league on Monday nights, so I didn't want to teach Monday nights. And of course, there was there were sporting events on Wednesday, and so faculty didn't want to teach on that day. So it was driven by what the faculty member wanted instead of what the students wanted, what worked best for the students. And that's where, where we're going now, more and more learner-centered uh, education. We also are using smarter technologies and adaptive learning, which is a term we can explore later in discussion if you wish, but adaptive learning allows uh, the LMS, the management system, to analyze the knowledge of the student and respond to uh, to their knowledge. And when they take a quiz, depending upon which wrong answer they choose, it will take them to a module that will dispel the misunderstanding by the particular uh, confusion that they had. So smarter technologies are going to make a big difference. A number of us have heard of pedagogy and andragogy. Pedagogy are really practices for teaching the youth teaching younger students. Andragogy is to teach adults. And we're going to see much, much more andragogy because our lives are driven in a technological society. And so jobs are changing very rapidly. In uh, the United States, uh, the average worker works for an employer for only four years. I've been with the University of Illinois for almost 50 years, so, so I'm a dinosaur, but four years, and then they move to a different employer and a different job. But when they move, they're going to need training and education. And so it becomes lifelong learning. Well, these students, of course, cannot easily 
move into a dorm if you're 47 years old and you have a family that just doesn't work very well. So, uh, so delivering the learning online um, is the preferred method in this lifelong learning mode that we're approaching. Well, there's one more goji, as we call it, out there, and that's shootagoji. That really has been driven by the internet and this lifelong learning concept. It is the self-directed, self-motivated learners. And we all do a bit of that when we pick up our smartphone and, uh, uh, hey, you know, hey, Google, we, we look up on Google or some other uh, search facility. Um, we're doing micro versions of self-motivated learners. You know, what's the population of this country and what's the weather going to be and uh, whatnot. But on a broader scale, this has become recognized as the mode of delivery for lifelong learners and particularly for those who are adults. And in fact, sometimes we call it the 60 year learner that they'll be with us all the way into their 70s um, as they continue to learn at colleges and universities. Well, there's much about the quality and some of you have heard of Quality Matters, which sets a, a number of rubrics and tools for the review of learning design. The goal again, to assure that uh, we communicate clearly and efficiently as we develop our e-learning. Um, in looking at student-centered learning, it, you know, that really has become the focus of what we do. And even in this COVID environment, there are many broad lessons in this article that uh, came out in April, as I recall. Um, and uh, it's uh, from Educause, a very large association on educational technology. So you can just click on the graphic here, I'll show you how that works. And here we are, student-centered remote teaching and uh, lessons learned. So in, in the case where there's a graphic, you can click on it, or of course the hyperlinks. Well, the worldwide impact of the pandemic, pandemic is going to continue to play out uh, for the next year or two. We're all anxiously awaiting uh, a vaccination and treatments, and we'll see how that goes. Um, but most of the experts seem to think it's not going to happen in June or July or August. It's going to take some time. So as we look forward to, uh, in our case, the fall semester, we found even today a very large system of universities, the California State University system with all of their, oh, I don't know, 15 or 18 universities will remain online in the fall. Um, and so we all are charged with finding the best way to deliver learning. And uh, uh, well described, uh, once again, in an Educause article is this one. Um, and you see here a, a cube, more or less, and a ball, uh, trying to demonstrate the difference between what we would call um, e-learning or online learning and remote delivered teaching and learning. And by that, we have a whole set of, of rubrics and best practices. We've been at this for nearly 25 years in delivering learning through the internet. And so we found ways to reinforce formative assessments, all kinds of tools. But, but, but many of us, and perhaps where you are located, we were only given two weeks to take classes and faculty members who had only taught face-to-face -face and turn them into online classes. Well, that's not the same as if you begin planning a class, you identify your learning outcomes, you look at the technology and delivery systems in order to take most advantage. You know, I was talking to the development staff at a university, Michigan State University um, in uh, Michigan, of course, in the US. And they have 50,000 students 
and many of your universities are of equal or larger size, and what a monumental task you and they face in moving their classes online in only two weeks. It just, uh, you know, people lost a lot of sleep <laughs> trying to prepare for that. Well, there are tools and approaches that are becoming more important as we move forward that enable both faculty and students to better understand what, uh, what e-learning can provide and what areas. Once again, another article that I encourage you to look at, um, the question it poses, will this semester forever alter college? Um, that is, will we always be online? But uh, the answer in this report is virtual tools will continue to be with us. And so maybe we'll begin incrementally to take advantage of these tools. Well, now looking at the future trends and technologies for e-learning, all of us, uh, I hope, have been exposed to virtual reality. You know, you put on those goggles and, and uh, you know, you're kind of blind to the world. You have to hold on to a railing and, and then you're put into a whole uh, virtual world or or AR as we call it. So that's virtual reality first where you're totally immersed. Augmented reality um, superimposes in, uh, images over what you see. Um, and so you can see, still see around you, but you can interact with objects. There's XR, which is mixed reality. Uh, and mixed reality enables uh, kind of the best of both. It's immersive but also you can, um, you have the option to uh, see the uh, environment around you. And finally, uh, well, not finally, artificial intelligence, as I say here, and finally quantum computing. So these are the technologies I just wanted to mention. Uh, also in between gamification, if, if any of you are parents, you might know, and perhaps you yourself, are. Uh, you might know students who are driven by video games and getting to the next level and all of that. It is a strong driver. And so um, we can incentivize learning in that way. Um, not exactly with games, but using the incremental incentives to encourage learners to advance within the course or curriculum. Um, so gamification, and this is, uh, here are some great examples at this site of uh, gamification, and that's something that you might want to look at uh, at another time. So, <clears throat> well, um, VR and AR, great videos on YouTube. Here's one, encourage you to take a look at it. Um, one of the continuing challenges is how to teach science online, because you know, if you can't pour chemicals together, a beaker or pipette, um, how can you do that? And here's a, here's a great video on the future of augmented reality in science education. It allows visualization and interaction with experiments. And so we're right on the cusp. We're, we're doing some of that even now with simulations. You know, I mentioned putting on those VR headsets. And if you put them on, um, perhaps you found them to be uncomfortable after a half an hour or so, they're relatively awkward and heavy. Well, this is what has been released. Um, it is available now, um, but uh, not as refined as it will be. You see this is a contact lens. And this contact lens takes the place of the VR hood. So when you put those in, that you see only the image directly on your eyeball, on your eye, you see the image through contact lenses. These lenses are uh, also prescription lenses. So when you turn off the VR, you have your prescription uh, working for you. So this is you know, not, not widespread adoption yet, but we will see that in the coming two years. Artificial intelligence is the 
big change coming not only in e-learning, online learning, but also in our society more broadly. And it raises promises, but also some perils. And there are some ethical questions. You know, one of the things that we look at, I was, I attended the third annual US-China conference on uh, AI in education. And we talked about the cultural differences between programmers. Uh, programmers from one culture will have an emphasis on certain things and on, uh, from, other, um, from other nations uh, or cultures will have a different emphasis. And so how do we work with that to maintain our culture? And I think that's important for all of us. You know, certainly we want to maintain uh, the culture that you have and the cultures around the world as you develop your own AI, which is happening, of course, uh, quite well now, but just recognize if you change, if you try AI from another continent, you might find a difference. Well, within artificial intelligence, there's machine learning and deep learning. And, and uh, I'll give you an example, uh, which is really upcoming. Um, I, there's a video link just below this from Professor Asha Gole at Georgia Tech University. Um, the uh, Georgia Tech University put their Masters of Computer Science online. Um, he was assigned a class to teach in artificial intelligence. And the class was uh, at 300 students. He was given six teaching assistants and he brought in a seventh. Um, and as he moved forward, um, the assistant he brought in, Jill Watson, was not very successful. But over time, um, that assistant became so good that Jill Watson was nominated for Teaching Assistant of the Year at Georgia Tech. Well, well even the students in this artificial intelligence class did not recognize that Jill Watson was not a person. It was a Watson, IBM Watson computer program, an algorithm that had been written in artificial intelligence that learned about the course and learned about the students and answered the students' questions so efficiently that some students chose to nominate her as the best teaching assistant at the university. And so, um, I've had the good fortune to meet with Ashok a couple of times. He's developing this for all of us so that we can buy a model that doesn't require the Watson computer. It's on generic uh, um, program platforms for, mm, he hopes, $15,000 that would allow us to create for the, uh, uh, the, the software to learn the class that it's put in and so it becomes uh, a teaching assistant. And that's something you might, might think about, we might talk more about. There have always been essay, not always, but better and better essay graders, essay bots that'll write it. Um, those who might read the New York Times or Forbes or Bloomberg, so many of the news sources. Um, Bloomberg, I think has 60%, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, one third of all reports are written by AI, not by people. New York Times, a large number are written by artificial intelligence, not by people. Um, what savvy students are doing, I'm sure, but has not been marketed is this. They say, I have a research paper due this afternoon and it needs to be, um, 15 pages and, and I need to cite at least 10 sources. And it has to be in this uh, citation format. Um, so computer, please do that for me in the next 15 minutes, send me an electronic copy and I'll submit it. So as a faculty member, this is a challenge, isn't it? Because I, you know, I traditionally have required papers to be written. And now if the computer can research 
let's say, epidemiology, looking at COVID or at SARS epidemic before COVID-19. Um, and if it can write well enough for the New York Times, that's a real challenge. And that's something we're going to have to deal with. Well, here's uh, Asha Gold's video. He has many more. Lots of links here on AI. Um, quantum computing is about to change everything. And um, I just want to draw that to your attention. You, you might have heard of Moore's Law, which developed about two years ago in computing. That was that the processing power of computers would double every 18 months or so. And that held up for about 20 some years. Now quantum computing has Hartmut Nevin's law and he's predicting growth that is doubly exponential. So that's uh, two to an exponent of two to another exponent of X. Charted on a graph, the change, the, uh, the processing capacity of a quantum computer is vertical. It's essentially vertical. It's not that we learn moving up in a linear fashion, we, we move just straight up. Um, and in fact, there was kind of an interesting thing this past summer. It was the Google 24 qubit computer was given a, a challenge to beat the reigning um, supercomputer. You know, and this changes, different countries have these over, the, over time, but as at that time in summer, it was a summit called Summit Supercomputer. It was in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And they were given the same problem. So Google's quantum processor called Sycamore was given the, uh, uh, the problem. And the problem had to do with finding prime numbers under certain parameters. It took the Sycamore computer 200 seconds to solve that. Um, while the summit computer estimated, as it calculated, it estimated it would be 10,000 years to come up with a solution. That gives you a sense, 200 seconds compared to 10,000 years in processing power. I have a couple of mini lectures. Um, I, I put these up just because the character looks so much nicer than I do. So I put this character, put this up and uh, they might be of interest to you. There's one other aspect I wanna mention uh, related to quantum computing and, and that's quantum entanglement. Einstein called it spooky because he couldn't quite fathom and that is that qubits, which are uh, the bits, if you will, of quantum computers. If you put two qubits together and then send one off in space, um, and you change the qubit you have, the other one will change instantly. And when I say instantly, it changes faster than the speed of light. We don't know how that is or quite why that is, but, uh, but it's something for us to ponder for the future. So with that, uh, Dr. Fahad, let me pause and, and I, I imagine there may be questions. Oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, sorry. I'm saying thank you for this uh, uh, speech and, and uh, it's really interesting to see how things have evolved uh, through the years. Uh, uh, there are a couple of questions <clears throat> But uh, before we go into the the uh, uh, part, uh, you know the attendees' questions, uh, I was thinking, you know, uh, what there there is a lot of articles these days being written, especially with COVID nineteen, mm -hmm. uh, and there are so many scenarios that have been you know have been indicated and presented. One of which uh, is that the the uh, post uh, uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, anything related to online education, anything related to online learning, whether it is uh, uh, adaptation, whether it is technology, things that would have took some universities or some institutions decades, uh, honestly, to adapt, uh, that will change because of COVID-19. The adaptation will be actually much, much 
quantum uh, and quantum <laughs> speed, honestly. So instead of spending a whole decade or a couple of you know years of uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, adapt online education, that I think this is going to take less than that. So what's your take on this? Do you, do you agree that the post epidemic uh, uh, is going to change ed tech? Absolutely. I, I, you know, I think exposing people to the anytime, anywhere aspects of e-learning is going to make a big difference. However, my only caveat is some of us understandably didn't make that change very well because we only had, let's say, 10 days for a thousand classes and, and only had 10 people to do it. We couldn't, we couldn't do it well in that short time period. So some people are going to say, yes, it has potential, but it wasn't very good. I just as soon show up in a classroom. So we're going to have both of those, but absolutely we're going to have more that uh, will be, will find the benefits of e-learning to be very attractive. Excellent, uh, and I do agree with that as well. I, I do believe that there will be a, a, big, a, a big change in the adaptation. So if, if there are those universities uh, that only had a couple of uh, colleges that were only adapting, I think, uh, the adaptation will go much wider, hopefully. Let's take a question from uh, the attendees. Uh, good evening, Professor. Do you think that we must modify our courses to be able to apply e-learning systems as assistance for the teachers, like math, for example? Well, yes, I think, I think all classes need to be reviewed. And faculty members certainly need assistance in doing that review because our faculty members are experts in, in math and they know about, you know, I never made it past Calc 1. That's as far as I went. So they know all about math, but they don't know all about how best to present this, how to engage the student because they do it like this, you know, like I'm teaching to you, they do it with hand gestures and, you know, uh, they're on a stage and they engage the student that way. So doing that online is different. And so, yes, it does require reformatting, but also there are some advantageous technologies, one of which I, I mentioned, which is adaptive learning. So, you know, over all the years I've taught, I always had to aim right kind of at the middle of the class. There were very smart students who probably didn't even need to take the class, but I could only toss them a question or two to challenge them. And then there were ones who just didn't get it and, and I needed to spend more time with them. And so those at the very top and those who were a little slower need more attention, but you can do that electronically. You can do that through e-learning when, you know, as a human, we, we can't do that as well. Uh, excellent. And, and also, like you said, uh, the technology advantages we have today are really helping us uh, target that. And, and uh, even with the technology, for example, the application program uh, uh, interface, APIs, uh, now uh, it right. helps a lot with, you know, you can incorporate different softwares into one, one environment and you know, yeah. utilize the different technologies. So And, and that's a, a, a less appreciated, you appreciate it, but many don't. The interoperability of all of these technologies is, whoa, that's, that's a huge task, but that is being done cooperatively among the providers. Uh, another question is uh, how to balance between students Pedagogy learning styles and the personalized learning requirements, making sure that everyone gets their required attention. Yes. So um, online learning, e-learning, allows you to present material, let's say in four different ways. I mean, you can do many more than that, but let's say you've got mostly a visual learner and then mostly an auditory learner and mostly a kinesthetic, someone who wants to manipulate things. 
where it works best for them if they can see it or hear it or touch it. Um, so you can do those three models and you're not limited by a lecture hall with 70 students and only doing one method, but instead you can say, here's our assignment for the week and choose to take it this way or this way or this way and see which one works best for you. Um, but also what you hinted at, um, uh, Vod, is that they, uh, that we collect those data early on and we can see how those students succeeded in classes that took this approach or that approach or a different approach. And coming into the class, we can say, why don't you try this one first? Because we believe from prior data that this is going to explain this difficult concept to you in a way that you're most comfortable. I agree, and, and this is where AI can you know, uh, be integrated uh -huh. as well. So AI could utilize that data uh, and yes. actually help the faculty uh, as becoming an assistant as well, uh, indicating right. that this could be the best way to go. Yes. Uh, another question is, uh, how can we achieve wonderful learning outcomes with low-level learners? Ah, yeah. So um, as it turns out, uh, the technologies of e-learning work very well with low-level learners. And also, when we talk about universal design for those who have disabilities, it can be very, uh, very efficient in providing you know, uh, the technologies that allow for that. Gamification can work very well. Um, so that, that's one of the areas I would look at first. And, you know, we have a staff, I, I, just briefly, uh, our university has almost, uh, let's see, we have 26 of our degrees are online and uh, some are replicated on campus, but that's about half of what we do. And so we have, you know, a, a staff of instructional designers. So um, what they would recommend first is take a, let's take a look a way to gamify this that will engage the student, that will reinforce them again and again and again. It's that reinforcement that keeps them engaged. And I think sometimes low level learners um, drop off because we are not reinforcing them often enough. Uh, another question here is, uh, what is the difference between remote teaching, online learning and e-learning? Uh, well, did you, did you write that one? <laughs> I appreciate that. So <clears throat> remote learning is where you take, commonly, you take a class that has been taught face-to-face -face and you deliver it through the internet and you don't make a lot of changes. You just, you know, we, we had that assignment, so we're going to put it online. Now we're going to put it online. Now we're going to put it online. E-learning is a broader concept commonly, although both the e-learning and online learning are used interchangeably in the vernacular, in the common language. But e-learning looks uh, as well at training, whereas online learning more commonly is academic only. Now, e-learning in, includes online learning, so it's a broader term looking at uh, developing the pedagogy, using pedagogy, that is planning and practices, using theories and, and research to find the best practice that works for this instance. Um, so both online learning and e-learning do that. Great. Uh, a question here is uh, student-centered learning. Can you mention some strategies and techniques that are suitable for these days. So, you know, what would have you done or what do you do uh, in order to help your uh, students? So this is something if you would share, please. Yeah, sure. So we ask the student, we, we engage the student. So for example, um, the professor, the faculty member uh, determines the learning outcomes. Those are absolute. We, we need, because of our curriculum, you need to learn A, B, C, D, E, F. But in learning those, how do you want to, would you like to do a group project on this? 
or would you rather do an individual paper? Would, or, or would you like me to simply quiz you? Is to engage the learner to, to express their preferences and then you respect their preferences as you teach. And so along the way, you know, you, you respond to the students. For example, um, perhaps most of your students are preparing to become, um, I'll say Python programmers. That's the artificial intelligence language. So they really want to prepare for that job. So if you're doing case studies in your class, you might take case studies from, from technology companies or technology departments. So it's relevant to them, to their career path. So you think of the learner and you respond to what's driving them. And in so many cases, what's driving them is a career is, is to, and when they complete, they want to pursue a career. And so you might include in your class bringing in an expert from one, two or three companies that do that and allow the students to do, have this kind of Q and A with uh, uh, someone from the various companies, you know, uh, that uh, develop uh, where they wanna work. And uh, so it, it kind of gives them an interest and keeps them engaged. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, a question, uh, do you agree that digital uh, citizenship courses is a, or are a must in the elementary stage and other stages as well? Uh, and whether uh, uh, are you, or, you know, do you have experience in your country or you can share what you guys did with that in the States as well? Yeah, so um, many, perhaps most high schools. So that would be students from 13 to 18, somewhere in there, um, have digital citizenship classes. Some of them have it in middle school, even earlier than that. Um, I think it's critically important. This is where so much, this is where industry takes place. A lot of government and certainly politics and policies. I mean, these all are shared, news is shared. So how do you know? I mean, we here in the United States hear a lot about fake news and, you know, who can I trust? How can I responsibly consume this? I, you know, is this real or isn't this real? And so to be a good citizen, you need to understand that. I, I have, uh, I've taught this for years, even at the college level, I've included uh, one week dealing with how to validate internet sources. You know, you get something and how do you validate? How do you know that's, that's reasonable, responsible? or is someone tricking me, you know, trying to take advantage of me? So I, I drew upon the libraries at 20 some institutions and got their best practices for validating as they worked uh, with faculty. These were academic libraries, but yeah. So long answer, but important topic, you know, we all have to educate the youth and um, our citizenry to uh, responsible digital citizenship so that they can make uh, reasonable decisions. Thank you. Uh, there is also a question here on uh, e-learning can help in transferring knowledge, but can it help in transferring skills? Yeah, so we're seeing much more of that now and we're seeing it with virtual reality and with augmented reality so that there now you can run an experiment and do it virtually. Poor, um, I recall I, I once took, oh yeah, I had a beaker of water and I poured sulfuric acid into it. Not supposed to do that. I didn't know. <laughs> I was in high school. Boom, <laughs> up it went. <laughs> Luckily I did it in a, a fume wood, you know, it would, it didn't get me, but but um, so you can do that with the outcomes um, built into the software 
for augmented reality and virtual reality. So building those skills um, can be done. I mean, not all cases. I, you know, I, and I think many can come over time. If I were teaching um, shop, how to lathe, you know, you have a wood block going around and you, you get it down into a cylinder. Well, it's hard to do that in a tactile way. But I, I did a presentation, um, gosh, I think it was in January. It was earlier this year at a medical school. And one of the other presenters was uh, a physician, but also a professor in medical school. And increasingly, they're doing that. I also serve on uh, the Technology Advisory Committee for, uh, uh, for a medical school in Nebraska, the University of Nebraska Medical Center and School. And what they have, which is interesting, for their surgical residents is that, let's say they're going to do an appendectomy, you know, pull the appendix out, it's inflamed. So as they go into that surgery, they can first put on the goggles and put on gloves, tactile gloves, and do it virtually once, twice, make sure they don't have any bleeders in there. And then they scrub and go right into the operating room and do the surgery. And that's many medical schools do that now where they can practice the surgery immediately before they do that. And if I have to have surgery, I want them to do that. For sure. Uh, uh, another question is uh, if, if we want to make effective e-learning programs for teachers, what are the most important competencies that they must master in order mm -hmm. to succeed as teaching online? Yeah. So um, we have a, a program where we do that. Um, and we have, uh, you know, enrollments mostly in the US, but elsewhere. And so we really begin with an overview of some of the things we just talked about, of the pedagogy. We try to understand student centeredness. The very question that, that we've had uh, here, it is how to respond to the student. Um, effective, you know, what's interesting to me is that particularly with professors rather than K-12 instructors, at least in this country and probably there, the professors are experts in the subject area, but not necessarily in teaching. And their degree might be in, you know, uh, some sort of engineering or physics. But if you have a K-12 teacher, they've taken classes on practices and methods of teaching. And we haven't done that with faculty. So sometimes at universities for the first time, they're exposed to pedagogy and andragogy and student-centeredness and things like uh, formative evaluations. Some faculty members might just give a final, but, but then they don't know if they kind of lost their class way back weeks ago. And so those formative assessments are important. So it's those kinds of practices are very important. Pedagogy, effective practices, also technology. And so, but that's never ending. You know, one of the things, um, is that I do these, I do Twitter and you know uh, LinkedIn and whatnot, but I have some blogs specific to educate to technologies where I put out three articles every single day that I think are worth reading because it's a fire hose of information coming on those technologies. So part of my job, I see, because I had to do it for my university. So every day I spend about an hour and a half screening all of these sources to try to find what I think are the three most important topics to share. And I have a queue, so sometimes it's like a week late, but it's still you know, only a week late. And I put those up so that people can click on them and keep try to keep up with what's coming out like that, that uh, little um, you know, uh, contact lens 
for uh, virtual reality. Excellent. Uh, a question here is, could you please explain more on how uh, your university or uh, you know, Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, how are you use, utilizing AI within your LMS and design a suitable course for students? Uh, but, and how can faculty members and teachers go over it? Yeah, so each of our campuses of the University of Illinois um, supports our own teaching. And we do it with, uh, most recently we're using uh, Smart Sparrow, which is an AI uh, software company. There are many others. Newton has gone with a publisher, but they're one of the better known ones. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of plugging in questions and answers and alternative answers and, you know, so that if they get the wrong answer, taking them to a module. So it's a, a matter of constructing artificial intelligence now, mostly for adaptive learning, for having the computer adapt to the student rather than the faculty member, let's say with a class of 50 students responding to every one because they're all at different levels and you can't do that very well if that, and unless that's the only thing. And even if that's the only thing you're doing. So it's adaptive learning is what we see, but, but so much more. We're also using it kind of administratively as we bring students into the program to begin to compare depending upon what courses they took before they were admitted, which high school they came from and how they did in math at one high school varies. If they got an A, that may be different than an A from another uh, high school, which may be more advanced. And so we can begin through AI to take this large data and help us understand um, what it means. And that's really what a lot of artificial intelligence does is it's taking big data and allowing you to dig in and pull out answers uh, to questions you might have. Uh, and, th and this would take us to, uh, there are several questions here that all asked about quantum computing and, and how it would affect the privacy, uh, you know, the privacy concerns that are associated with it. How do you think that is going to impact the true implementation and adaptation of quantum uh, computing in the future? Yes, and privacy is an important topic. Um, we have regulations. Uh, FERPA, it's F-E-R-P-A, I've forgotten what it is, federal something, something, something. But anyway, personal identification. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the computer might know that, but we won't know that. Uh, there are concerns. That's why we all have to be engaged in monitoring and testing the application of quantum computing. You see what's going to happen with quantum computing. Quantum, and so artificial intelligence and quantum computing work together. Quantum computing driving artificial intelligence, gathering and processing the data at incredible speeds will supercharge, supercharge artificial intelligence. So all along the way, yes, personal information and privacy. I mean, the cynics in our society will say there is no privacy anymore. Um, you know, I give up a lot when I buy on Amazon and, you know, and other uh, sites. It, it, I give up a lot of information and all of a sudden advertisements appear. Well, that was something I just searched for and it, oh, and, and it just kind of, you know, all of that happens already. And so some of the Amazon web services, they know a lot about me. You know, they know I like to fish and they, you know, they know a few of these things, but, and, you know, um, I, I don't know, they, they know this too. I, I got a great price on this, wa on this water, Perrier, you know, which otherwise, I got a super price. Um, so they know all these things. They know, you know, I'm a penny pincher. Anyway, my point is a lot of it's already out there. 
And what that means is I think we're going to see more of that. And that's a concern. You know, I grew up, my early years were in the 1950s and we had our privacy back then. We don't have much privacy now. And I'm not saying that we should give up, but, but we have already surrendered a lot of our privacy. So um, this has to be monitored and um, we have to fully inform our students when we gather those data and say, all right, student, no, if you apply here, we're gonna collect this and this and this and this, and just know that. And uh, if you don't want us to do that, well, either we'll try to accommodate or if we can't, you may have to go elsewhere. And that's the truth. It's a hard truth, but it's where we are going, I think. It is, it is the truth. And, and we do give our information out even when we download an app. So yeah. uh, it's already out there. Yeah. Uh, a question here, there's a, a couple of questions and I'll try to sum them up in, in just one. Uh, you know, concern about students' behavior, uh, uh, you know, uh, within the online environment. There is concerns about the assessment. How can we make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do? It's not someone else. It's not AI, right. not, you know, right. uh, how can we tackle that as well? So uh, uh, that's maybe a summary of a couple of questions that are. Yeah, so one of the things that we found, and I'll tell you a little embarrassing anecdote about our program. You know, we monitor which, stu which students fail. We, we call them DWFs. If, if, do you have letter grades? Ds, yeah. Ws, Fs, yeah, okay. And W is a withdrawal. So we, we uh, do a, a quick survey and ask them, well, you know, what went wrong? And the most common answer in online classes is this. I forgot I was taking the class. <sighs> so, you know, if they're taking a class in high school or on campus, they walk with their friends to the class. No one is reminding them and they forget for a week and then another week and we send them emails, but students nowadays, they don't read emails, right? They use text and Instagram and anyway. So there is a maturity concern and we find that online majors in, in our university, average about 30 to 35 years old. And they pay attention. They don't forget because they paid for that class themselves. So they pay attention to it. And uh, so I think there's a maturity level. Now, about having people who are not part of are, uh, someone taking a class for another person. Um, one of the things that we use commonly is a tool called Examity, but there are many more out there. There's ProctorU and whatnot. And I, you know, I always kind of wondered about them. I'm going to reach into my wallet here because what, what the deal is that they have to, uh, uh, these are electronic proctoring. And so the student has to, whoop, here we go, hold up their driver's license next to their face and someone compares that. And then they have to take their webcam and show under their desk and all around their room. And now you start taking your quiz to prove that it's you. And one of the things I was surprised when I took it, um, the proctor said, you're looking down towards your keyboard too much. And you know, I, I do pretty well touch typing, but but the numbers, I, I never, I always look down for, in my case, the numbers. And they said, you do that one more time, I'm gonna report you to your teacher. So um, a proctor, a person is watching that video or the video is supplied to the instructor or they use an algorithm, artificial intelligence, to follow eye track to see what you're doing, to see if you're looking at answers that are written on your hand and stuff like that. So there are technologies to help defend against that. Um, 
it's difficult to defend against wall cheating, but but you certainly can cut down on it. Excellent. Uh, we still have some time, so we can go through a couple of questions as well. Okay. Uh, one of them was, uh, what is your input on uh, 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 whether to go with a blended approach or whether, you know, is it is it synchronous or asynchronous? Uh -huh. What's the percentage between the two? Or should we just stay purely online? You know, it's it's a, I know it's a combined question, but uh, okay. uh, you know, uh, I'll I'll give you the opportunity to dismantle this question as you see fit. Okay, thanks. So um, let's talk about blended learning. The seminal study, the first big massive study uh, in this field, was by Barbara Means for the U.S. Department of Education, and she looked at it was a meta study of over a thousand other studies and of online blended and face-to-face -face learning. And in that study, it was about 12 years ago, she found that blended learning worked best as far as student success and meeting the learning outcomes. Then online learning, because the students didn't have an 8 a.m. class and they were tired, they had the class at the time that worked best for them, at least that was the premise. And then third was face-to-face. -face. Um, whether we should do synchronous or asynchronous, I think we really need to look at the needs of the student. Um, most of our learning at the University of Illinois Springfield is asynchronous. And that's because we have students who are nurses, who are um, in all kinds of professions where their shifts change or their longer shifts. And, you know, you can't, they can't come to a synchronous class just like they can't come to campus at, you know, and just like you all are doing now, thank you for doing it at, at 10 o'clock at now 11 at, at night. But um, so synchronous is, you know, if it works for your students, that's fine. But I think it's a combination still with asynchronous to allow students to learn at their own pace. We find our international students um, say that they really liked online in part because the faculty member did not just call on the first hand that was raised because our international students are translating the question and then preparing a response. And it takes them two or three seconds instead of half a second to get their hand up. And so they say, everyone is heard. And the faculty member responds. So a faculty member poses a question in the discussion board. They respond to every single student in the class and give them some response. So that creates that connection. And I think students value that. But there are times when synchronous learning works well. Like now, you're able to ask questions, I'm uh, responding. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, also a question from, uh, you know, someone who says that the engineering uh, departments within universities and other, uh, you know, hands-on uh, uh, educational practices uh, believe that e-learning will never, uh, uh, you know, replace the hands-on skills that students learn in the real lab, uh, they just mm -hmm. want to on that. Right, so, you know, never say never. <laughs> never say never because quantum driven artificial intelligence and those uh, gloves and, uh, uh, you know, like the physicians are doing surgery and then they, you know, they, they can feel through the gloves how hard it is to cut and open. And they pinch off the veins. I mean, those things are being done today. Now, can they scale to all engineering? I, I can't say, but I think they will. I, you know, I don't underestimate um, AI and quantum computing. I mean, there's such power there. And what we find, by the way, is like in chemistry, we find industry is changing. Less often are they pouring the beakers they're, they're pressing a button and 
a robot pours it for them, which can be emulated, of course, online. So, um, so we're seeing industry moving toward computer driven as well. Great. Uh, we can take an, another couple of questions and then uh, we can end up. Uh, for example, sure. uh, a question here is about uh, how can we make e-learning attractive for young learners? Mm. Yeah, I think um, we can do it with gamification. I have an eight-year-old grandson. <laughs> you know, he, can I have apps now? Can I have apps now? You know, you hear this all the time because he really likes playing with computer apps. <clears throat> so we can begin with that and, you know, iPads and visuals. And so I think we begin by making it a game and out of the game comes the learning. And I think that's probably one of the best approaches. Excellent. Uh, another question was, which is really interesting is, is uh, how can e-learning help uh, those who cannot read or write, you know, uh, 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 help them learn new skills and new knowledge and gain new knowledge? Yeah, one of our um, important parts of e-learning is what we call universal design. Now, we don't always include those who can't read and write, but what we do is to develop modules that allow students to see what's occurring. And if they can't read the captions along the bottom of the screen, um, then maybe they can hear it. Or if they can't hear it, maybe they can read it. So it's a matter of designing for disabilities, whether they be learning disabilities or sensory disabilities as far as eyes and ears. And I think um, in each of those cases, uh, it's adaptations of, um, of learning programs that allow us to begin to meet those needs. I'll finish with the final question, uh, which is, uh, has been repeated uh, several times, is do you see uh, that uh, universities and school will be more, you know, will be uh, going to a virtual schools and university rather than the on-campus ones? Yeah, I see that um, on, I, I see that campuses and physical schools will be there for decades to come. But like my university, more than 40% of the learning is online. Our online majors are almost half of our learners. And I see that number incrementally growing so that we'll still provide the on-campus learning for those who can afford it, for those who have the time and, and the resources to be able to do it. But for the rest of the world, um, we're going to do it through e-learning, through online learning. And I think our goal shall be to do it as well as we can so that it's as good as, or in some cases better than face-to-face. -face. Excellent, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the e-learning center, the National e-learning center for providing the opportunity to conduct this webinar and, and for setting it up. I would also like to thank uh, all of the all of you who attended for your time, for your investment, and I do apologize for not answering all the questions, which is due to time concerns. And there's so many questions out there, but we try to at least create a theme for most of the questions and answer those questions based on the themes that were uh, 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 delivered to Professor Ray. Uh, uh, final notes, Professor Ray. Um, the final note is I, I recommend you have that URL. And I, I don't know, Dr. Fahad, if you might be able to share it in some way, but um, I, you know, it's uh, sites.google.com slash view slash e hyphen learning hyphen history. And if uh, because there's that's where the material is, 
feel free to email me. Look forward to communicating with some of you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time again. And I hope uh, everyone benefited. And hopefully now we have a better view of what to look forward to in the future for e-learning. Uh, and again, uh, it is not a one-stop shop. It is not a one-size-fits-all. It depends on our requirements. It depends on our pedagogical approach. It depends on several issues that we need to take into consideration when designing and thinking and applying uh, 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 or integrating technology in our educational processes. So thank you all again, and I wish you a great night. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Professor Ray, again. And uh, Godspeed, be safe. Uh, wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.